And greetings. Wow, it's been a, a long time uh, since the last time we had a chance to be together, or at least a month. And I'm so happy to be back here. And thank you so much for bringing me into your places. As we continue in our sermon series, uh, Ephesians Blueprint, and we'll be winding this series up at the end of the month, uh, hopefully by the last Sunday in August, and uh, moving on to other things in the fall. So we're looking forward to that as well. I have a question for you. If someone asked you what are the non-negotiables for your faith in Christ, what would you say? And would you be able to define those non-negotiables? Author Dennis Rainey asked the same question. What are the non-negotiables in his article for FamilyLife.com? And in that article, Rainey presents what he calls seven essentials for the Christian life. And as we continue today with the Apostle Paul's household code in the text that we're going to be dealing with, Rainey helps us with two of his essentials. First, Rainey would suggest, love God, not the world. And he asks a very probing question that we should pay attention to. What is the object of our affections? Is it traveling the world around? Is it a, some sort of hobby? Is it money? Is it power? Is it influence? Is it a new car, new house? What is, what is the object of our affections? Apostle John, in his first letter, said this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And you find that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. You know, my friends, the world is continually, every day, trying to conform you and me, trying to shape us, mold us into its own image. And it offers seductive and appealing things to its citizens. So to Rainey's point, those who love God with all their heart, and with all their soul, with all their mind, will do what God wants them to do. They will be concerned about his word, his will, and his mission. Second essential, believe God, not the deceiver. You know, the Bible teaches very clearly that our human nature moves in one direction spiritually, toward unbelief. And Rainey highlights this in his article as well, and we shouldn't be surprised that sometimes we don't want to believe the truth. Rainey asks another probing question for us this morning. When life and scripture collide, which one do you believe and trust? Life or scripture? We need to think this through. Because you see, the deceiver, Satan, wants us to believe a lie. Will you believe and obey God's word as revealed or the deceiver? Jesus put it this way one time when he was um, addressing a certain group of Jews. He said to them, and he's very direct here, uh, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 44. So, first essential, love God, not the world. Second, believe God, not the deceiver. And as we look at Paul's exhortations in this text that we're going to be looking at today concerning children and parents and slaves and masters, we would be wise to keep these two essentials with us in the journey. So please turn your Bibles to chapter 6 of Ephesians, and we'll be uh, looking at verse 1 to 9. Chapter 6, verse 1 to 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 7. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. So, Lord, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for this time. And, Lord, there's so much that could be said in in this particular text, so much that we could uh, uh, try to put into practicalities and to understanding. But, Lord, we just trust you by your spirit that you will uh, give to us today what we need for this day. And help us to understand this text and not only understand it, but uh, put it deep into our hearts and spirits and then work it out with our hands and feet as we move from this uh, moment into other times and places. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, my friends, before we unpack these nine verses, what we should notice, well, what I would like us to notice, pardon me, is that Paul placed these nine verses uh, between two important sections of his letter. We'll call them bookends. So the front end uh, and the back end, these two bookends. And the front end, that bookend, starts in chapter 1 through 3, where Paul there clearly explains the gospel and the impact of the gospel on individuals and corporately on the people of God. We are reminded in chapter 1, verse 1, that Paul addresses his letter to the saints who are in Ephesus. These were those people in Ephesus that were set apart, consecrated to God. That's what saints means. And they were faithful in Christ Jesus. And this Jesus that Paul is speaking of was now seated at the right hand of God. And this very same Jesus now is head over all things to the church. We find these verses in chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. We see more though, more there in those verses as well. Matter of fact, Jesus is far above all rule and authority, Paul would go on to say, and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age, one we're currently living in, in the first century as well, but also in the one to come, that is the one when Jesus comes and sets things right. When we began this series and we talked about one of the, a number of the presenting issues, uh, uh, and I just want to challenge you, maybe you can remember some of those presenting issues of Paul's day, and the particular one that he addresses in Galatians and even here in, Ephes- in Ephesians is what were the Jewish Christians to do with the Gentile Christians? And Paul's response in Galatians, as we went through that series, and here in this letter, was at the point to Christ who was the fulfillment of God's promise. And he reminds his, his, uh, uh, the church in Ephesus and reminds us as well that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Chapter 2, verse 1. Yet God, in his bountiful mercy and great love, made us alive together with Christ. Chapter 2, verse 5. And not only made alive, but raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's verse 6 of chapter 2. And this great salvation that Paul is teaching us here in in Ephesians was a gift of God. That is not of anyone's doing. But as he would say in verse 8 of chapter 2, by grace you have been saved through faith. So God, my friends, in his purpose and plan from eternity past, created through Christ as one, as uh, John Stott in his commentary on on Ephesians said so well, quote, a new society made up of every tribe and people and language and nation. And we find that that text in Revelation 13, 7. And moving along again with the front end, this front book end, 
uh, from chapter 4, 4 all the way through to chapter 5, verse 21, Paul now unpacks the content and the context of this new society that Christ has created. It will be characterized by certain key markers. And I want to offer you, from the text, six of those key markers. One, the individuals in this new society will be recognized by their power, their strength, their money? No. The text tells us by their humility and their gentleness, their patience and their love, especially their love towards each other, and not only towards each other, but towards others as well, even their enemies. Number two, this new society will be united by the very Holy Spirit that brought them all together in the first place. It's a role of the Holy Spirit to uh, grow and honor Christ in the church. Three, God by his Holy Spirit will provide all that his new society will need to grow in their unity, their maturity and knowledge of their Savior, Jesus Christ. Number four, each member of the body of Christ is what we're talking about. But I like the term, the new society will have a part to play, and there's a, there's a goal in mind here, and we see this in Ephesians 4.16, uh, they will have a part to play to build itself up in love. That's the motivation, love. Five, the new life in Christ will be evident in the individual's daily walk and in the corporate body as well. You will see a growing in holiness, and it should be evident Speaking the truth with love will become the norm, not the exception. Dealing with human emotions, such as anger, a normal human emotion will be dealt with appropriately. Good citizenship will be in the, mar in the making as well. What one says with their mouth will be for the edification, the building up of the other person. Integrity of character will be important. And love, love, love will be evident in thought, in word, in deed. And six, seeking to glorify Christ in all the ways and in all the things will be the primary motivation of the corporate body, which will be lived out day by day in the individual and practical and evidential ways. So that's the front end, the front book end. Now the back book end the, that puts these two, um, puts verses uh, 1 to 9 in between uh, can best be can best be summarized by Paul himself and we look at chapter 6 verse 12 for that where Paul said for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places friends we recognize that the efforts and the movement of the culture to shape our worldview and impact our churches and our families and our workplaces with values and morals that stand against the truth of God's word is primarily a spiritual battle. It's spiritual warfare. You know, the deceiver, the Bible explains, uh, Satan often uses people to do his bidding. And it's interesting that often our de default position is spending all our energy and efforts fighting against people when Paul reminds us that the armor that God has provided to protect and defend and even to go on the offense is primarily spiritual. So and to summarize these bookends that, uh, that we find our verses in between, verse 1 to 9 in chapter 6, uh, we can summarize it this way. One, God has provided, God has provided his word and Holy Spirit to empower each member of the new society to what? Walk in a manner worthy of their calling. Chapter 4, verse 1. And two, God has provided his word and his Holy Spirit to be strong in the Lord and to stand firm in the spiritual warfare against the deceiver and his agents. That's chapter 6, verse 10 and verse 13. 
So with these things in mind, we now can turn our attention to Paul's exhortation concerning children and parents found here in verses 1 to 4. But I do want to back up just a bit to chapter 5 to verse 21, where we find the motivation, the impetus, if you will, for verse 4, from verse 4, pardon me, verse 1 to 4. And let's read verse 21 in chapter 5. Submitting to one another out of reference for Christ. And this word submitting in the original language means in this sense, according to Vine's expository dictionary, quote, a voluntary attitude of giving in, a cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. Thus, the corporate body of Christ, the body of Christ, the local church, submits to one another in cooperation and out of reverence for Christ. It's this very same attitude of cooperating that Paul exhorts in chapter 5, verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And this very same attitude is the attitude that children and parents should demonstrate towards each other as well. But with children, Paul adds a command. So let's read verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The word obey in, is a verb in the Greek. It's a verb and it's an imperative. In other words, it's a command. It's a command for the hearer to perform a certain action by the order and authority of the one commanding. For example, we see this when Jesus calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee, his disciples, and Sea of Galilee and his disciples said this, What sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Well, he's not just a man. He's God who created the seas and the winds, and they obey him upon his command. Matthew 8, 27. And I will be appealing to John Stott in his commentary to help us inform our approach here in these nine verses. And if we spend some time carefully reading through this text, we, we will see that Paul builds his instruction uh, to the children and the parents and the masters and the, serv- uh, the masters and the servants on three foundations, three foundations. Actually, I should backtrack on this is, this is to do with children and parents. Three foundations concerning the obedience of children to the parents. Let's deal with that first. Children to parents. So three, from nature, from the law, which is the word of God, and the gospel. So let's deal with first from nature. Please notice the phrase here, for this is right. What we have here, my friends, is an example of natural law. That is, it doesn't take special revelation from God to understand that children obey their their parents. This has been written, as Stott puts it in his commentary, on all human hearts. And if you were to do a, you know, a study of human civilizations, yeah, we recognize that parental authority over children is a vital uh, component for a stable, healthy, flourishing society. And when parental authority is, uh, over children is eroded, well, then there's, prom- there's problems. And we know that Paul talks about this to Timothy when he talks about in the latter days and last days, there will be sometimes a difficulty. People will be disobedient to their parents, and that's in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. And just a caveat there, we've been in the latter days or the last days since Jesus showed up the first time on this earth. So, back to the text. First from nature, now second from the revealed law. And this is what is called special revelation. So let's read verse 2 and 3 together. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Verse 2 and 3. We should note here that Paul now conflates two Old Testament scriptures here in verse 2 and 3. Paul takes Exodus 20, verse 12, where you find the Ten Commandments, and he conflates that with Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. And just on an interesting note, which I think will will make sense here in a minute. The Jews of Paul's day taught that each of the law's two tablets contained five 
uh, commandments. So when God wrote the law uh, on those tablets, he wrote five on one tablet and five on another tablet. Thus honoring our parents, which is the fifth commandment, goes along with those concerning our worship of God. So there's no, there's not just a great, there's no great leap to understand that honoring our parents really is in the same vein as our duty and worship to God as revealed by the very first, by the first four commandments. But friends, here's the bottom line. Children who are obedient to their parents are essentially acknowledging the parents' God-given authority. And of course, obedience isn't the only thing that children offer their parents. We can also add love and respect for the parent as well. So we have from nature, from the law, and finally the gospel. Please notice the phrase in verse 1, Obey your parents in the Lord. Here is the responsibility of children to obey their parents because of their relationship to Jesus. Uh, Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 20. Paul said, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Well, friends, now we turn from the child to the adult, the parents. And let's notice here in verse 4, concerning uh, the father, the highlight of, resta- of restraint. There's a restraining going on here. But I want to expand this to both parents. And what we have here uh, in, is the Holy Spirit working in and through the parents. And we should recognize that parents are to be self-controlled, they're to be gentle, they're to be patient, they're to be kind to their children. In other words, they are to manifest the gift of the Holy Spirit as we find in Galatians 5.22. Parents are not to provoke their children. They're not to rouse them up to anger, not to exasperate them. Exasperate them. But they are to, what the text tells us here, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And this phrase, bring them up, means to nourish, to feed. So we not only nourish and feed our children physically, but we also do it spiritually and emotionally. I just want to take a sneak peek, as I'm calling it here, back into the time of Paul and consider the Roman family of the day. And in the Roman family of Paul's day, the father had absolute authority. In regards to the children, if you so desire, you could sell them into slavery or you can make them work in the fields along with all his other slaves. The Roman father was a law unto, unto himself and would be in his rights to punish his children in any way he saw fit, and up to and including the death penalty. And I think this uh, should show you how counterculture, cultural the Christian household would have been in Paul's day. Fast forward to our time, and thankfully, uh, many of the ways that children have been treated in the past uh, and cared for have changed. However, terrible and evil things, my friends, have been put upon children and sadly, sometimes, or maybe often, more often than we'd like, in the name of God. And and Christianity's hands are not clean on this issue, and we need to recognize that and acknowledge that. And many Christians today are silent when it comes to abortion and child exploitation uh, currently in our culture. And here it is in a nutshell, followers of Jesus Christ that love God, not the world, that believe God, not the deceiver, care for their families as God the Father cares for their children. My friends, while time's not on our side, as we begin now to unpack Paul's exhortation concerning slaves and masters, and we could talk a lot about uh, how Christianity influenced that over the centuries, and how some people have a problem with the text it doesn't, isn't a little more uh, you know, assertive in that area. We just don't have time to talk about all those things. So I just want to stick to the biblical principles revealed in the text here concerning slaves and masters. Now, slavery was the norm for the majority of human history. But we need to say this, and we need to say this clearly. It would be unacceptable for a follower of Jesus Christ to approve of human slavery in any form or for any reason, period. And you see, what's often missed when dealing with history of slavery 
is that it is not necessarily about skin color or whoever won the battle or the war. My friends, slavery is an affront to God because every person is born, that every person that is born is created in the image and likeness of God. This is what makes us human. Slavery is dehumanizing. It treats what God has defined as in his image and likeness as property. Therefore, what Paul was highlighting in this text are the biblical principles that are timeless and transcend his time in the first century where slaves were a real thing and masters owned them and brings them into our current century, 21st century, where we can see this in the employer, employee-employer relationship. So what then are these biblical principles? Well, we need to keep in mind what we said right from the beginning that Paul, Paul here is addressing, and, he, and we need to address this in the same way he's addressing the saints who are faithful in Christ. So we're talking about Christian employees, Christian employers. First principle, obey your earthly masters, verse 5. So how is this made manifest? How is this played out? Well, one then behaves as a servant of Christ, verse 6 knowing that they will receive back from Christ their just rewards. If they're being mistreated at work, if they're not getting what they want, if they're being uh, abused, they need to know that they, one day they will receive their just rewards from Jesus. Second principle, and Mounts in his Greek translation uh, puts it this way, serving with enthusiasm as though serving the Lord and not man. Verse 7. So with these two biblical principles in mind, Paul points us to the goal of these principles. And it's twofold. And the first part of it is to keep Jesus Christ front and center in all that we do. Whatever we do, we keep Jesus Christ front and center. We need to remember that there are disciplines to our faith in Christ. It is about reading and studying, reading and studying the Bible on a regular basis. It is about praying on a regular basis. It's about attending church regularly. It's about being accountable. And it's from these spiritual disciplines that one will be able to make manifest as the Holy Spirit works in and through us, the respect and integrity and good conscience in their, our relationships outside the home, including our work relationships. Well, moving on to the last few verses, we deal with the masters uh, and the employer. We'll call them employers. Again, we keep in mind that Paul was addressing saints, faithful in Christ, so we're talking about Christian employers. And for them, there's three biblical principles in effect. And one, number one, can easily be said this way. Give respect, you will get respect. Or as Paul put it, do the same to them. Verse 9. So friends, if you want to receive service, you give service. Second principle, stop your threatening. As a parent is not to provoke their children, the employer is not to provoke or threaten their workers. They are not to abuse their authority, not to abuse their power. Third principle, we just read the text, knowing that he who is both their Lord and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. It's important to understand whether you're an employer or you're an employee, that you will not receive any favoritism from Jesus Christ on judgment day. If you have power and you have money, that's not going to be taken into account because Christ will judge impartially. That brings us to the end of this text. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's a, a lot of things we could have done with this, some very practical things that have not been covered when it comes to children and parents and employees and employers, but that was just not uh, possible in the time given to us. But I want to leave with you something, something that you and I can take away from this day 
that will help us very much in our relationships with each other and those outside our community. And John Stott put it this way. Our great need is this clear-sightedness to see Jesus Christ and to set him before us. Let me say that one more time. Our great need is the clear-sightedness to see Jesus Christ and to set him before us. So in our relationships, our primary relationship must be Jesus Christ. Above all relationships, must be Jesus Christ. That's why we need to do those disciplines. We need to read the Word. We need to understand the Word, so we need to study it. We need to go even beyond that sometimes and learn some other things regarding the Bible. We need to pray on a regular basis. We need to do all those disciplines. We need to remember that God created a new society, one that represents Him on this earth through Christ. Our great need is indeed the clear-sightedness to see Jesus Christ and to set Him before us. Well, thank you so much. Why don't we pray now? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the message. May we we take this to heart and Holy Spirit help us to live this out and to bring all the glory and honor to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.